May I invite Professor Wong Gang-hu, University Professor NUS and Emeritus Professor of Australian National University, is already having his way here. Professor Wong will at Professor Wong will chair the session. Thank you. I'm uh, very honoured to have this opportunity to meet all of you for this convention. I think it's a, a great thing. It's been going on for some years, and it's been a wonderful opportunity for Singapore to host uh, so many people who are interested in both Singapore and the region. Uh, I have the pleasure and honour to uh, introduce our speaker, but actually I don't need to introduce him. But as you can see, Senior Minister Teo Chi Hen is very knowledgeable about all the subjects that you need to cover as a diaspora. Singapore, of course, is an ideal place since Singapore is largely a nation of uh, migra migrants, and migration, of course, is at the heart of a diasporic experience. But if, in fact, as you look at his CV, as you can see, he's, uh, he's, in, he's been in so many areas and has had experiences in so many different areas. But uh, among the two things that I thought was particularly eye-catching for me was that he's in charge of smart nation for the future. That's for one. And the second part was he's also very much involved in the population and talent uh, future for Singapore. Both these areas are very much to do with diasporic experiences, in my view. And in fact, the whole history of uh, the diasporic experience is that, to begin with, the most enterprising risk takers who were the merchants who went out, and many of them settled abroad and became, as it were, the foundations of new diasporic communities, followed by people who were desperately poor, looking for opportunities to, to make a living, who also very often are the people with the most resilient temperaments, who have the capacity to work hard, to adapt to very difficult circumstances, and to arise from them and make successes of their very difficult lives. And in fact, not only that, but produce descendants, generations of their children, to provide the very dynamic, elements in the societies in which they, they settle. In fact, that experience we have known for over the last couple of hundred years in particular, very well recorded. But most of all, in the last few decades in particular, but since certainly the middle of the 20th century, we have now a different kind of uh, migratory experience. You might say it comes from globalization, but it means, in fact, the migration of the most talented people who are in fact already very finely uh, positioned in their own countries, but who now see the global opportunities that the smallness of our world today, the technological possibilities that have enabled people to move so freely and create now a new generation of diasporic experiences which are actually very different from the past, but nevertheless, accumulatively adding to the world's diasporic experience. In fact, we look, look at figures of uh, 61 million South Asians, but actually look around, the whole world is full of now migrants in every country in the world. Migrants from every country in the world. Migrants have settled in different countries of the world, comprising, I would say, some of the most dynamic and enterprising, adventurous people, risk takers, that are making the world so prosperous and so dynamic and so technologically efficient and pro progressive for the last few decades. So we're look, looking at a very different world. And I think Senior Minister outlined some of the opportunities, not only for Singapore, for the South Asia, but actually linking us all with the rest of the world. So I would like you to pursue this with the Minister, Senior Minister on issues further, to, to take this forward, to see how it is relevant to all of us. Minister, thank you very much for that. But I invite questions to begin with. May I? Uh, yes, please. <coughs> Good morning, Senior Minister. Uh, thank you very much for your speech. Uh, I was planning to ask about the, uh, how the diaspora from Southeast Asia and South Asia could connect and what are the things that they could do 
beyond what uh, what has been currently done but i think in your speech you already covered given the uh, economic dynamic economic growth as well as the uh, demographic dividends the regions have. You already covered the infrastructure opportunities, trade and investment opportunities. But towards the end, what you spoke about the youth uh, and the connections that could be had with the work attachments, the youth, that caught my uh, attention. Uh, in my uh, previous assignment with Singapore Management University, I had the opportunity to have about uh, 325 odd uh, SMU students go and do internships in India. Uh, and the region. But what I've noticed that over the years, on both sides, the, the rules and regulations have become more difficult, and it works contrary to the, you know, the things that you said, and I perfectly believe that that's the way forward, that the youth should be there engaging with the, both the countries at the ground level with business and uh, work attachment and so on. Will both sides look at these and reduce these barriers to exactly put in place? Because what, where we were, we have, it has become more difficult, and it's on both sides. Thank you. Well, I can speak only for one side. <laughs> and our side is quite a small side. <laughs> but what we try and do is to do things by, to have a demonstrative effect and to have a motivational effect to show that these things are worthwhile doing and that there are benefits to be gained. And so, as you say, there were 325 students uh, from your experience in SMU who had benefited from internships in India. And I was talking to our young students just now and I encourage them to do so because I think one of the advantages of uh, being in Singapore is that we are very multicultural. Uh, one of the strengths of Singapore is that we are very multicultural. And uh, that is very important. Uh, so we continue to encourage that, and we hope that our friends and partners in South Asia do so as well. Uh, but my own experience is this. When one comes to a new country uh, to have this kind of internship experience or life experience, one also has to be open and to live in that society uh, in the context of that society. Now, as a student, uh, I went to the UK to study in, in, in the northwest part of the UK, in Manchester University. And in my first year there, um, the students from this part of the world, Malaysians and Singaporeans, I could actually count the numbers on the fingers of my hands and toes. <laughs> and there were about 20 of us. And by the second year I was there, we numbered in the low hundreds. And by the third year we were there, we numbered in the mid hundreds. And I could see what happened in the interactions among the students. The students, we used to have a wide range of interactions with students from all countries. Then that began to narrow. And then we became quite contented to interact only among ourselves. And I thought that detracted from the experience of, well, being in another country to understand what's happening in the other country. So one needs also for that kind of experience, it's not just numbers, but the quality of the experience that is important. And I think we should focus not just on numbers, but quality of experience. Uh, that's just the additional comment I want to make to that. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, please. Uh, Senior Minister, my name is Aisha Khan. I'm from Pakistan. My question has to do with climate change. If we look at the international report uh, by the Intergovernmental Panel and uh, we continue on this path of 
temperature increase according to the present course, South Asia is going to come under great stresses. According to the World Bank report, around 800 million people's lives will be at risk. Uh, South Asia also happens to be a very divided and volatile region. How do you think the diaspora can play a role in working together to ask for climate justice and prepare for a future in which the lives of billions will be affected? Thank you. Well, indeed, I think uh, <coughs> South Asia exemplifies many of the issues that uh, we see in climate change. So both sides of the equation, the mitigation as well as adaptation. Mitigation is how to uh, slow down or, 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 or stop um, the climate change taking place. I think slow down is more realistic than stop. And adaptation is what do we do uh, given that climate change is taking place and there are effects on us? So what is it that we need to do to make sure that our countries and our people will be able to um, survive and continue to prosper? So I think both sides of the equation, South Asia represents quite an interesting uh, example. So for example, if you look at um, uh, sources of energy and energy use, uh, how one, where one's energy and say electricity generation comes from, I think quite a lot of it is actually coal. And, and one has to look at this very carefully and look at the technologies involved and make sure that um, as a major emitter and as we grow, we do so in a responsible way. I know that every country has its constraints and it's it's, you know, it's not just and fair either to tell a country, look, you stop emitting for my benefit <laughs> and the world's benefit and your people you know, don't have electrical power and so on and can't, can't grow and develop. I think that's not fair and just either. But I think it is responsible to try and do so in as climate-friendly <clears throat> a way as possible. So there are choices that we can make in relation to the kinds of energy sources we use, the, the, the environmental rules that we put on emissions. And I think these require the society and the economy carrying some cost. And it's an issue really of externalities because in many countries, um, the negative externalities of emissions are not properly carried by the persons who are emitting and benefiting from the emissions. And that's the unfortunate case. So, uh, and the effects fall on those people who are actually not benefiting from the emissions. And so there's a negative externality problem and one has to be able to try and get those negative externality internalized into those who are emitting and benefiting from those emissions. And one example is what we do in Singapore with cars. Now, we did it primarily for congestion uh, control, not for uh, emission and climate change reasons, but we came to the conclusion that actually traffic congestion and car use impose very serious negative externalities on others and on the economy at large. And therefore, we decided to have car control policies and car both population, car population as well as car use in order to have the externalities fall on the correct places. And so that's what we have. And we have also introduced the carbon tax uh, at a very modest rate, but uh, uh, we think that that's important for sending a signal and placing the negative externalities properly on the emitters and the benefiters of uh, climate uh, of, of emissions. So I think there are many of these things that can be done. There are quite a number of countries in which the use of highly pollutive energy sources are subsidized. We're not even talking about uh, a carbon tax, but the subsidies for pollutive sources of energy are still taking place. And I think if some of these things can be removed, it will be helpful. Now, on the adaptation side, what do we do uh, to, to uh, make sure that we are protected? 
I think that the studies have shown that there are quite a number of areas in South Asia where uh, there are delta regions, major delta regions, uh, in which they would become inundated with, uh, um, uh, with, with higher sea levels. And in fact, a recent study shows that we may well have underestimated the effects on cities because many of the data points, height points in cities, were taken from uh, satellite observations, satellite sensing, and because the satellites are sensing the built environment and not the ground level because of their sensing limitations, um, we may have un overestimated the elevation levels of cities by a couple of meters, which will have quite serious consequences. And if you correct it for what the ground level is, the inundation extent can be much more than previously expected. So there are things which we need to prepare for there, and the, and the problems are real. But I think these are some of the things which I talked about, which I think uh, governments can do and which are sensible and which need to be explained uh, in a way which is understandable to the, pers to the people. And there may well be countervailing um, measures which we can take to protect the most vulnerable in the event of, say, imposing uh, the proper price for the use of energy and the cost. So, I mean, if I take just one example from Singapore as well, we price energy correctly. So electric power, we price correctly. But we know that this places some vulnerability, places uh, some burden on those who are the most vulnerable families. So instead of setting a low price for electricity, we set the correct price for electricity, but we actually provide um, what we call utilities um, uh, 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 grants into the families, uh, you, a, a sort of utility bank which uh, that the family can use and the family can draw down on this bank but at the point at which he uses that extra kilowatt hour he is facing the correct price so he's either paying it out from his own pocket or with some drawdown from his own bank but every time he draws down from his own bank he faces the full electricity and the correct electricity price and so that's a better way of doing it than to provide subsidized electricity where the price that you face is an unrealistically low electricity price. So there, there are some mechanisms for doing this. Do you have a question? Oh, yes, please, right at the back. Good morning, uh, Senior Minister. My name is Aditya, I'm from India, and I represent an educational society. Want to ask you about one of the major challenges, I presume, that not only South Asia faces, but ASEAN faces, is especially for the youth. The most difficult part of, of a young person's life seems to be the transition between education and employment. And many curriculums in educational institutes uh, are consistently falling short of preparing youth for the future. Not only from a technology point of view, but also in terms of life skills, in terms of pro-social skills, and in terms of the uh, multi 21st century skills, what, the, what we're calling today. What can South Asia learn from the rest of Asia in this regard, and how can educational institutions step up and offer and ev elevate their curriculums towards bridging this age-old gap between industry and academia? Thank you. Well, when I look at a long sweep of education and how education has developed, I mean, when we switch from uh, simple agricultural societies to slightly more organized early industrial societies, then we move from a society that needs, how shall I say, mass primary education. And the society 
calls for it and needs it when a society is at that stage, mass primary education. And when you move to a society which is how sh uh, sort of an beginning to industrialize, as, as in the Industrial Revolution, then you have mass secondary education because those skills are needed in the workforce in order for them to read, write, understand machines, simple instructions, and so forth. The real move towards mass tertiary education, mass higher education, started, I think, really after the Second World War with the GI Bill and the land-grant universities and so on in the United States, where higher education was seen no longer as an elite activity, which went to 2, 3, 5% of a population, but to 20, 30% of a population, 40, 50% of a population. That really started after the Second World War in the United States, partly because of uh, a reward for those who went to the war, but also, I think, as a very enlightened way of looking at the future of what a country needed. And that, so the, the younger generation may say, okay, boomer, to, to that generation. But actually, that generation built the modern societies that we have today. But built it on the back of what I would call mass higher education which was actually pioneered in the United States. And that crossed the Atlantic into Europe, I think after the long hot summers of 1968 and the student revolts and so on. And so higher education became massified in Europe, in France, in Germany, and so on. But the new era and what you talked about in the transition between study and work. Um, I think study, you, you need foundational education at a primary and secondary level in order for a person to have the basics of education so that in the next phase of his life, he can continue to learn. And I think that's really the next key challenge, which is mass continuing education. So you go from mass primary, mass secondary, mass higher, and now you're talking about mass continuing education. And to look at education in a very different way of how work and education sort of intermingle with each other. So two things have happened. One, people live longer. Two, companies live shorter. So the whole concept of lifelong employment has been turned upside down. So you and your, your father and your grandfather could have worked for the same company, but today you will outlive the company that you work for. The chances are that that's going to happen. And you will outlive the technology which you grew up with in education. So the whole concept of continuing lifelong learning it's a new concept which needs to be injected into societies today. And that is the larger problem and the larger issue that we have. And how do you build that? Who pays for it? What institutions does it take place in? It? Uh, does it take place in? Uh, who pays for it? The worker himself, the state, uh, the company that he works for? Um, uh, those are important questions of equity and delivery and whether it actually gets done. And in what bite sizes are our present institutions which structure around three, four-year programs the correct ones? Or do you have to structure this in much smaller bite sizes? A sort of, uh, uh, a sort of how shall I say, um, uh, small meals rather than large banquets. So these are all important questions which I think societies have not quite been able to develop. We are trying to do this in Singapore with our skills future, with our, our uh, continuing education institutions. But I think this will be the next evolution of education and not just uh, the transition from work 
from study to work, but a whole transition of our education system. And I think this is beginning to take place. Thank you. Uh, next question. Yes. Hi, Senior Minister. My name is Jacqueline. So thank you. Um, I just want to ask a question because I'm a proud Singaporean. I'm also a working mother. So my question is, I feel that we are living in a bubble in Singapore where we face, uh, of course, a lot of luxury and comfort. So the question is, how can we really get our youth to understand the realities of the real world outside uh, so that they can continue to stay hungry and resilient so that we, Singapore continue to progress. And more importantly, uh, my daughter is in the audience here. Thank you. <laughs> so you want me to tell her what you are not able to tell her? <laughs> I'm even older than you. She won't listen to me. <laughs> but actually, I'm quite optimistic about our young people. The opportunities and the exposure that they have are tremendous. I... As a young person, the furthest I had ever been until I was 18 years old was across the causeway to Malaysia. We went to Malacca, we went to Penang, we went to Kuala Lumpur. That was the furthest I ever went as an 18-year-old. And today our kids are going all over the world. And not just are they going all over the world physically, they're going all over the world virtually. And so um, they understand the world and they have experiences which are much wider than we ever had. But what you say is correct. One must have the appropriate framework for understanding what the world is and some of the realities. And I think that framework, having that framework is important to have an understanding of what makes societies work, what holds them together, what drives them apart, what allows human progress to take place, what can retard it, what causes countries to fight with each other, and what can encourage peace. I think you need a framework in order to understand that. Otherwise, your understanding of your own society, of your region and the world, and even of the world of work and economics, is a very weak one. So I think when one looks at all these things, one needs a framework to think about them and to understand them a little bit more deeply. And not to be so judgmental, either of the young people or for the young people to be so judgmental of those who are older than you and say, oh, you have belonged to the past. <laughs> or for the older ones to say, oh, you are whatever it is, the strawberry generation or whatever. I think it's too easy to make these labels. I think it's more important to understand things at more than just a surface level, but to understand them a little bit more deeply. What makes, what holds a society together? What really are the elements that allow for progress to take place? How do you actually build peace, understanding, and harmony? These are not simple things, but things which require reflection and thought. Next question. Yes, please. <clears throat> oh. Uh, good morning, uh, SMTO. Good morning, Professor Wang. Uh, Pang Yian from Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank. I was thinking we cannot let SM go without uh, uh, answering this question about the RCEP. The, the question, the elephant in the room is, with India's withdrawal from the RCEP, uh, what does uh, SM think about the significance of it and what, what's the road ahead in, in uh, the collaboration and uh, cooperation in the region? Thank you very much. Actually, I, I feel very comforted having Prof. Wang Gang Wu on the stage because I was going to start off by saying I'll answer all the easy questions, all the hard questions I'll pass to him. He's a historian and a very eminent one. And I think that actually 
we need we we shouldn't just look at whether India is in or out, but we should look at the historical moment that we are at. And we are at a very important historic moment in the way that the regional and world architecture is being arranged and will be arranged. As I said, multilateralism is under threat. 50, 70 years of history in which the world has become more integrated, more open, working closer together. These basic things are being called into question now. And one has to remember the path that we have taken. And we need to ask ourselves, no matter how big or small a country you are, which countries have prospered and grown by closing their borders and reducing their interactions with others? And whether the history and the direction of growth of countries, big or small, which have opened their borders and looked for more integration with others have resulted in progress and growth and a better life for their people. I think economic history will give us very, very important pointers to that. And for a country like India or for South Asia, I think we must not live just in the moment, but we must look to where we want to be in 10 to 15 years' time. Ask yourself, where do we want to be in 10 to 15 years' time? What's the best place for us to be? What kind of region, what kind of world do we want to live in? And then, how do we position ourselves to get to where we want to be? and to get the region and the world to be where we want to be. And I think that actually the RCEP is not just you know, an arithmetical game of, you know, I, I get this, I get that, uh, this, 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 this benefit or that benefit. That's for the trade negotiators, the bean counters, to do the counting. But the leaders have to look at the region and the architecture and where we want to be 10, 15 years' time and to take us there, to shape that. And I think that this is a historic moment in which India can play a role, a major role on this stage and help to shape the rules, the norms, the attitudes of the region, a huge region, and of the world. And it will be a lost opportunity not to grasp it. Not from the bean counting point of view, but from the overall strategic point of view. And then in 10 to 15 years' time, when you look back to 2019, then you can say, what if we had done this or we had done that? And are we better off or are we worse off for it? I think that's the perspective to take. Not just for India but for all the countries which are taking part in RCEP. To some extent, yes, it is a leap of faith. But if you look at a country like Vietnam, tragic, war-torn history, 50 years from the Second World War onwards, never a single year without conflict. <laughs> 1990, because of the circumstances that they found themselves in and the changes that have taken place in the geopolitics of the world, they decided to change course, Domoy, open up. Look at where they are today. And they are strong advocates of ASEAN integration, of TPP, CPTPP, and of RCEP. 
they have felt, they have seen the benefits of integration and the growth that it has brought. So I think we're at a historic moment and history will judge us on the decisions that we make. I'm afraid we've run out of time. There have been so many questions, but let me say that uh, you must agree that we're very grateful to Senior Minister for sharing his wisdom and his, his thoughtful comments about being strategic in thinking and historic moments that we should take into account. Uh, you can see that uh, Singapore is in good hands when they leave questions of smart nation and searches for talent in the hands of senior minister here. And you will join me in showing our appreciation for sharing his thoughts with us today. Well, thank you very much. And please have a good day and good discussions. Thank you once again, senior minister and Prof Wong for such an insightful and informative sharing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.